Welcome, everyone, to another episode of the Life Itself podcast under the auspices of our new Exploring Social Transformation sort of series. Um, I'm really, really delighted today to be welcoming Carl Stayert. So Carl is really someone that I would call a visionary, and I don't use that word lightly. He's been facilitating personal and collective transformation across almost the entire world for over 25 years now, working with everything from people in prisons to nonprofits, international communities, and you know, even Silicon Valley tech companies. Um, he's a certified trainer in nonviolent communication, um, a practicing therapist, and also very closely to my own heart, uh, a martial artist um, with a, a black belt in, in Aikido. Um, and having studied under Marshall Rosenberg, Richard Swartz, Thomas Hubble, Joanna Macy, and Thich Nhat Hanh. Now, Carl is the founder of the Cultural Catalyst Network, a global community of change makers integrating inner, interpersonal, and systemic transformation, and has recently um, joined Life Itself in collaboration around some new, really exciting transformational residential programs, which we will get into today. So, Carl, huge welcome. Thank you for joining us. Thanks so much, Theo. Thanks for the warm welcome. I'm really glad to be here with you. <laughs> so just as a, a starting point, I'd love to hear in your own world, Carl, kind of what actually, you know, words like kind of personal and collective transformation, are, you know, quite broad to say the least. So mm -hmm. what it is that you see yourself as doing the different strands of your work and kind of how they, they play out um, on the ground? Yeah. Yeah. Thanks, Theo. So I think I'll answer that question on a couple levels. One is especially after such sort of a glowing and uh, sort of describing all the maybe places where I've done work in the world, I also want to just name that the words that come to me, I, I see myself as a champion of human wholeness. And by that, I mean, uh, to the best of my ability, and I do that imperfectly as well, is just that I really think it's potent for people and myself to try to show up with more of the facets of who we are than might typically be considered acceptable or welcome. So in other words, yeah, I, I want to show up in this conversation with you as my competent part, as the part of me that is uh, polished, that is knowledgeable, that has this rich experience. And at the same time, I also have the aspects of me that are broken, that are struggling, that are confused at times, that can feel lost. And speaking to that does a couple things for me. One is it allows me to relax into being more of a whole human being rather than performing when I'm relating with other people. And then the other aspect is that this aspect of being a champion of this wholeness is that I want to live in a world and I want to experience community and relationships where other people also feel safe to show up as their whole selves, that, they, that we don't have to feel like we only can show up with our competence in a way that sort of locks us into a rigid way of being. So that's, that's one answer I would give to your question about what I do in the world. And in really concrete, maybe conventional terms, my, my work looks like running trainings, workshops, um, doing consulting, doing individual coaching and therapeutic work. But the work that I'm beginning to do with life itself, and which is really actually closest to my heart, is helping to cultivate transformational learning communities. So spaces where people can come together, whether it's for a few days, whether it's for a week, whether it's for a month, or perhaps even multiple months or years, how can we create spaces where people can do the multifaceted aspects of personal and collective transformation? How can we grow up in the various aspects of who we are? How can we become more connected to our wholeness, to our gifts, to our ability to contribute our uniqueness to making the world uh, a healthier and more beautiful place? So again, that's still a bit broad, but I think our mm. conversation will get into more depth as well. So yeah, thanks. Absolutely. There's, there's so much to unpack there, but th thanks for sharing. I'd like to just start by picking up on this idea of wholeness that comes up a lot. And I really love that idea of kind of, you know, being uh, 
you know empowering people to, to show up in, in their wholeness I think that's and you kind of use there also the language of parts and you know certain parts of you that, that are wanting to show up in certain ways and then you know I believe for, for those that don't know this is kind of drawing on the internal family systems framework which you are kind of you know a, a practitioner in um so I suppose one of the the interesting questions is why have you gravitated and how, what's brought you towards kind of a this idea of wholeness and how have you sort of seen it lacking and sort of you know that that as an area of focus and then I suppose specific, specifically internal family systems as a, as a route to, to enabling that that wholeness because it might seem initially a little odd to people that we're talking about lots of different parts of ourselves but at the same time saying that's a kind of a route to showing up as a whole yeah thanks um so first thing I want to name is that I do really enjoy the clarity and the methodology of internal family systems therapy. And it's, I'm glad to see it gaining more and more attention uh, globally and among people doing transformational work as well as therapeutic work. And there are other modalities, whether it's in psychology or in spirituality, which also speak of the multidimensional aspect of human being. So for example, uh, Carl Jung, you know, spoke of sub personalities and, and really we're, we're talking about or archetypes and, and we're really talking about the same thing here. I, um, so that said, what I've found in my experience and I've heard others resonate with this and I'm curious about your own experience with this deal. What I've found in my own path of personal growth, of psychological development, of spiritual exploration is that there can be a tendency to um, emphasize like, oh, I need to be awakened in a certain way, or I need to be evolved or integral or et cetera, which I think are wonderful aspirations. And yes, I want to be a compassionate person. I want to be an empathic person. I want to be an awake person, et cetera. However, there can be a danger in my experience of if I, if part of my psyche latches onto that idea that, oh, I need to be enlightened and, and has some fixed idea of what that should look like, I can begin to actually favor certain aspects of who I am and, and begin to suppress and actually just push underground or exile other aspects of who I am. And they don't go away, they simply go underground. And in fact, what I've found in myself and in others is that there can be a tendency by focusing on a narrow definition of, okay, well, we need to be enlightened or awake in this way or mature in this way. There can be a tendency to actually cause certain aspects of who we are to stay immature and, and a bit mm. stuck because they're constantly being pushed into the shadows. And so for me, I found a tremendous relief in realizing this notion of parts and uh, Richard Schwartz, who developed the internal family systems therapy model has just released his latest book for a popular audience called No Bad Parts. And I really like that title. It's really suggesting that all of our parts, like the part of me that wants to come across as impressive, the part of me that maybe feels social anxiety, the part of me that, um, yeah, that wants to save the world, you know, that, that all of those parts have a, typically a childhood survival uh, strategy that drives them to, to somehow try to find acceptance or love or belonging. And when I can recognize that even my inner critic, for example, has some kind of survival purpose, I'm able to have much more compassion for that aspect of who I am. And I can actually help these different parts of me that may be actually a bit immature or quite immature to grow up and find a more functional, collaborative and uh, helpful role within my internal system. So it's not just internal family systems, but many explorers of the inner world are beginning to recognize this multiplicity of the, our inner world. And by realizing that and helping those parts come into better uh, coherence, better cooperation, we seem to have more access to well-being, more energy, more compassion, uh, and, and more of this, what I would call wholeness. Mm. That's, that's fascinating. And one of, the, one of the questions that I really sit with in this context, and I think maybe this can lead us down the line into 
the broader place for this work in in social transformation is I know you're kind of like original academic background is anthropology if, if I remember rightly among other things um but kind of the degree to which you see these parts and particularly I suppose how they they show up as sort of innate versus kind of socially conditioned and you know I imagine as with all things there's going to be an interaction with the two um but how you kind of see the evolution I suppose of, of where we've got to now with with this potential kind of tendency to suppress parts or kind of favor others um, and how that's kind of interacted with the broader social structures we find ourselves in yeah I love the question and there's there's so many layers of that that we could explore <laughs> but I'll just start with one that I think is quite clear and to me really essential uh, Richard Schwartz has identified for example four particularly uh, strong, what he calls uh, cultural legacy burdens, which in a sense are these burdens which certain parts of us take on and that are in the culture. So for example, um, the four that he names in particular are patriarchy, racism, individualism, and materialism. And I, for my, personally, I can, I can see how those live in me. I can see how they live in many social structures that are around me. And so Yes, I, I do believe that these and others believe this as well, that we see that there's cultural conditioning that can vary from culture to culture or subculture to subculture or even family to family, the degree to which these different kinds of legacy burdens are taken on and how strongly uh, they are sort of rooted in our psyche. So let me just give a concrete example. Let's say materialism, just you know, noticing um, my own... De the, the degree to which I may have a belief that my material uh, wealth or my material success is a measure of my worth, is a measure of my lovability, is a measure of my degree of belonging in society. I like to think that I've transcended that to a certain extent, but I certainly haven't entirely. <laughs> you know, there's, there's definitely a part of me that has taken on that on board. And, and as you said, that's not simply something I was born with because we know there are some cultures in the world, both in the current uh, time as well as historically, that had the opposite notion that in fact, you know, there was a certain um, social rank in sharing, in, in not accumulating personal uh, wealth, but in, in giving it to others. And so uh, recognizing that to me and doing the inner transformation work to, to loosen up these sort of stuck cultural beliefs, not only I think can lead to better personal well-being, we can have more freedom, more flexibility, more sense of personal well-being, but allows us to also see how can we help shift that in the wider culture. And so, again, it's a larger conversation, but I'm mm -hmm. excited by what you're naming. Mm. So just to kind of play back and check my understanding a little bit. So what's the, these idea of, I think, cultural legacy burdens was the, the mm -hmm. phrase that, that mm -hmm. you've used there that sort of gets at this idea that maybe the, our, our parts and these different facets of kind of who we are at our core might be sort of in some sense sort of innate or at least you know there, there is this psychological truth to the fact that th these exist but that how we engage with them and how they show up is perhaps then mediated by our cultural context um if that, that's absolutely sounds... yeah absolutely. As, as well as our personal journeys and our personal experiences in childhood yeah. and adulthood yeah yeah great that that's super interesting and so that, that there's it seems to me there's almost this, this bi-directional influence of, of how we show up in the world, influencing the world around us, and then in turn, the world around us influencing how we can kind of show up and engage with ourselves. Absolutely. So, I mean, I think there's a really interesting question then here of kind of how this, this particular area of work, and you've touched on it in there, kind of fits with uh, a conception of social change more broadly. So, I mean, I'd love to, to delve into that a little bit. Be before that, I think just, you know, for yourself and in your work, what is the kind of the world that you'd like to, to see come into being more generally through, through what you're up to? Yeah, if I were to describe the big picture of what I long to contribute to, it would be uh, a world with a lot more... Uh, compassion for the wholeness in each other, a way that really human beings, I believe what can sometimes be called like a world centric consciousness. So in other words, where more and more of humanity is increasingly seeing all of life 
as worthy of deep reverence, respect, and care. And that that it would then be translated, that is increasingly, I think, in, in certain ways, translated into how we care for each other, whether that's in social structures, like making sure that, that we actually live in a society where uh, everyone's basic needs are, are held as primarily precious and, and essential to care for, as well as non-human life, you know, recognizing that, that, the, that not simply uh, the ways in which the ecosystem serves humanity, but that there's intrinsic worth and beauty and reverence to caring for non-human life. Um, so there, there are many more specific dimensions of what I imagine that world uh, is looks like that I believe many, many people on the planet are increasingly drawn to contributing to. I personally have, have a real passion for community building and I've worked quite a lot with eco-villages and I've lived in eco-villages like in, at Findhorn in Scotland or in at Oroville in India. And I believe these eco-villages are amazing laboratories and experiments in uh, human natural dignity. You know, it's like, how can we live ecologically, economically, socially, um, culturally in ways that are more in harmony with each other, with the natural world where where our social structures um, really care for the well-being of the whole. So that's mm. again, we could I could go on and on on a lot of these questions. I love the questions, and I'll I'll pause there. Yeah, absolutely. So I mean, what I'm hearing a little here is that the the hope is that people can shift their sort of I suppose abilities and capacities to engage with themselves and also their perceptions of, of the world around them and through that will kind of enact sort of the the broader perhaps structural changes um which can you know improve the society and in the way that you touched on um is that kind of a, a fair assessment and, yeah and I, I think one of the massively things, reductive <laughs> no 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 well i think how, how can we not do that in order to keep the conversation uh, you know manageable in the time but i, I would say you know i i've had my entire life, a real draw towards social change. And I've, I've, for whatever reason, from a very young age, I was interested in like, how can we treat each other uh, and treat the natural world with more care. And that's, I don't know all the places where that came from, both intrinsically and extrinsically, but that seems to have been a real drive for me from a young age. And what I found is that as I got involved with what might be considered activism of various kinds, whether it's environmental activism or uh, other forms of social change, I found a few things happening. <laughs> One is that I found the tendency in myself at times to become argumentative and to push or fight for change in a way that Initially, I often found a lot of counter resistance and found myself in fights with people about social change. And then I, I saw also fights breaking out or arguments, conflict breaking out within the movements that I was a part of, whether they were even peace movements with a great deal of conflict within them. And, and then basically people who were advocating for peace, but doing so in a way that seemed to me remarkably aggressive and seemed to evoke really like equally vehement and aggressive counter reactions from people who were, let's say, pro-war in a particular situation. And then those were anti-war, were, were sort of fighting tooth and nail against one another. And that over time has led me into a more and more looking at, okay, how is it that human beings can actually be more effectively collaborative and cooperative in affecting change? What, what actually leads to lasting, coherent transformation. And so that led me to looking a lot at interpersonal communication, how we deal with conflict, how we cooperate effectively, and, and then over the years to recognizing even people who may be exploring interpersonal conflict often may have inner conflicts or inner tensions within their personal psyche that were quite debilitating. And so that's led me to explore how can we find more and more coherence within ourselves and become more effective at la that level. So to summarize, <laughs> I'm, I'm ultimately quite interested in how do we create a world that's the more beautiful pl place our hearts know is possible using Charles Eisenstein's words. But I found that I believe 
looking at the interpersonal dimension of how we get along with one another and how we can do so more effectively and how we really function within ourselves and can have, in a sense, more coherence and self-compassion and inner clarity are equally essential, if not even more primary to affecting external change. Mm. Yeah, absolutely. And I think, you know, personally really resonate with, with your experience of, of activists and sort of social change communities in many cases, and I'm sure others will feel the same. And I think to that end, you do work yourselves, particularly with activists in sort of like bringing these kind of principles and practices that you're, you've touched on and will explore later into that work. I'd be really interested to hear kind of how you've been integrating that into broader, broader efforts around social change and activism. Yeah, I, I mean, I'm delighted to be connected with activists who are really hungry for this kind of work, um, because in the end, I do believe people have to come to their own interest and willingness. I mean, I can, I can open the conversation, I can offer a certain perspective, but ultimately people need to be ready or open to the possibility that we might actually be more effective at affecting change through, for example, doing inner work and certain kinds of interpersonal work. And I'm delighted to know really large communities of activists in North America and Europe and Asia in particular are three of the continents that I'm doing quite a bit of work. Um, well, and yeah, other continents as well, actually. I've, I know these communities of activists who are deeply committed to what might be called nonviolence in the Kingian uh, sense or in the Gandhian sense of nonviolence, uh, or in more contemporary terms, in this idea that, and this understanding that radical compassion actually can be a profoundly effective foundation alongside courageous action, alongside uh, really challenging the status quo, but doing so in a way that's deeply relational and that is able to see the humanity in the, the so-called opposition or the enemy. Again, it's not to simply be, um, how would I say, not to simply be gentle in a soft sense alone to in, in presenting an argument or in presenting a perspective, but how can we both boldly express what we care about, but in a way that also makes space to listen deeply to the person who may have a countering perspective? Because what we seem to find that whether it's, whether it's racism, whether it's environmentalism, whether it's any kind of Div potentially divisive uh, cultural topic, we seem to find the research that I've seen suggests that when we can come to someone with empathy, with curiosity and understanding, that is when there can be a profound shift in somebody's perspective. When we come with argument, when we come with logic, rationality, and really like focusing exclusively on presenting our own rational argument for what's right and what's good and what's correct, we often see people digging in their heels. And so I don't mean to suggest that only empathy is appropriate, but I do believe that empathy is a critical aspect and compassion are critical aspects of the wholeness of our effectiveness in being change agents. Mm, yeah, I mean, absolutely. And again, I'm sure many of us have had experiences of trying to rationalize to people that sort of seemingly for no, no good reason are digging their heels and pushing back. Um, I think one of the things that's been really interesting to me coming, so, you know, my engagement with life itself has completely opened up my, my perspective to a lot of the, this inner dimension um, and coming from sort of, I'd say a far more traditional background of, of left-wing activism. And some of the, the conversations that I might have with, with friends that are still, you know, Marxists or sort of people that are more in those traditions is this stuff's a nice to have, you know, it's great. We as activists might be able to function a bit better, but fundamentally, you know, it's all determined by sort of material structure at the end of the day. And, you know, unless you seize the, the means of production, then like you can have all of the, the inner awareness in the world and, you know, so what. Um, now, of course, the parody sort of somewhat to all my Marxist friends out there. Um, I, know, I know you're more nuanced than that, but kind of what, 
how do you respond to that kind of pushback of like, you know, oh, this is all well and good, but actually, you know, it's not the thing. Well, first of all, I, yeah, I appreciate you naming it because I think any time I begin to describe one aspect of what it is that I do, I immediately realize, okay, and there's a, there's a larger picture here, you know, so much as I do find a great importance in doing the inner and the interpersonal work, I couldn't agree more with your Marxist friends that, that it's crucial to be considering the larger structural inequities, uh, you know, oppressive patterns, et cetera, and, and the real you know, material realities of who has access to which resources. You know, so I, I ultimately, I believe that there's the necessity for a both and approach here. So any time that I might put too much primacy on only doing the inner work, no, sometimes we need to really carve out and, and protect some, some basic physical well-being in order to be effective in, in what we're doing. And so I believe that really it's the integration of the two that is ultimately going to be most effective. And so that, again, an approach that, that brings in wholeness, that's both whole person and a whole system approach is ultimately what I trust the most. I have the luxury of sometimes being able to create spaces or work with people where we don't have urgent, urgent survival needs banging at the door. And so I, I do think that there's a value when we can create those spaces so that people have enough breathing room to do the inner and interpersonal work and then go out even more effectively into whether it's the front lines, which is some of the people I'm working with are really doing front lines activist work that they find they're more effective when they're sometimes putting their lives on the line and that they, they find that they're actually able to protect their own lives and other people's lives more effectively. So whether it's that or whether it's lobbying Congress or whether it's, you know, affecting change in other very direct to direct ways, I do believe that the integration of both the inner and the external mm. is, is what's quite effective. But, I'm, but I'm, I'm glad for the reminder to not get too uh, overly focused in the navel gazing when there are people who are suffering on the planet at this time and when there are very real inequities that we're dealing with. Mm. Yeah. Absolutely. And, you know, it's something that I've always really loved and respected about your approach to this work, Carl, is that that kind of integration of that, that deep awareness of, of material reality and kind of, you know, how we can we can have that, that both and and, as you say, kind of bring the lens of wholeness, which you, you sort of engage your inner work with to kind of the issues of, of social change and kind of social action more broadly. And I think that's that's a really beautiful way of putting it. And, you know, there doesn't have to be this competition and actually often as you say that the way that you can be most effective in bringing out structural change is to to yourself if you've got the luxury um double underline on the luxury do that do that inner work which is going to build those capacities so yeah really thank you for, for outlining that so eloquently um and you've touched upon it a little already kind of your your trajectory through, through activism but i suppose to you know be it and get as specific as you want to the kind of modalities that you've ended up being drawn to or whatever else but kind of what's brought you to to this work and to, to this place in in sort of where you are in life where you're, you're doing what you're doing yeah there's a few different experiences i might speak to maybe i'll, I'll speak to a couple in particular one is as an environmental activist at the university uh, in the u.s i was at the university of michigan and i was part of a student group that was advocating for certain sustainability, environmental sustainability policies to be adopted by the university. And we, we had a list of, I, I think we probably did call them demands, which we were bringing to the university administration and really just um, very boldly, and, and I'd say somewhat aggressively sort of stating those demands to the administration. And what what I found um, is that there was an immediate pushback, resistance, I would call it, you know, potentially stonewalling or just like constant expression of what, what, why this, why what we were demanding would not work or was not possible. And something really amazing happened, which is the president of the business school at the time, uh, whose name was uh, Joe, Joe White, Joe White reached out to me. And Joe White said, Carl, 
I hear your concern about these issues. I'd, I'd like to offer, if you're open to it, to help support a dialogue between yourself and the vice president of the university. Because I, I've noticed, yeah, he, uh, he must have noticed some, some of the struggles that had been uh, unfolding. And I said, great, okay, I'm, I'm open to the conversation. I was a little wary because at that time, I, I had sort of a blanket belief about the administration and, and had a thought that, oh, well, the president of business school, like, is he really, you know, sincere, but he seemed sincere in reaching out. So I sat down with the two of them. And I was struck by the Joe White, so the president of the business school asked me, invited me to speak about my concerns and, the, and what my group was standing for. I expressed my concerns in my typical, probably passionate way. And what I experienced was that Joe White really reflected back what he heard me say. He basically just in a very organic, relaxed way, just expressed to me what he understood my concerns to be. My entire body relaxed. And I just said, oh my gosh, he gets it. He's on my side. I just, I felt so excited and seen and heard and understood. And then Joe White turned to the vice president of the university and engaged in dialogue with him, inviting him to express his concerns. And Joe White, again, really like reflected, listened to the vice president in such a way that the vice president relaxed. He began to laugh. He began to be a completely different person who, than who I had countered before. And suddenly we were in an entirely different conversation. There was openness to looking at what steps we could take together to address the concerns we both had. And I put that entirely down to the, the capacity to listen and to mediate conversation that uh, Joe White had. And I, I, I realized I've never reached out to tell him this. So I hope maybe I can even send him this recording <laughs> of this conversation to, to thank him for really a life-changing experience because he demonstrated, I don't know where he developed that capacity. I, I can say more about what I've explored since then, but he demonstrated to me a capacity of deep listening that I've found to be in my work deeply transformational in bringing people who are in opposition into potential collaboration. So that was one experience which was pivotal for me and led me to things like uh, nonviolent communication being one of the approaches that I've explored extensively as well as mediation and restorative justice. And so all of these approaches share what I would say could be called empathic listening in some traditions. It could be sort of a, a you know active listening or generative listening. Again, different different approaches have different even definitions for empathy and compassion and, and listening. But I've found those to be profoundly powerful practices within a larger sort of toolkit of practices. And and. What I found is that in any one modality, let's say nonviolent communication, I found such profound wisdom and insight that Marshall Rosenberg, as a passionate change maker and clinical therapist, developed. And then I've seen the limitations that human beings can sometimes uh, recreate in how we can dogmatically attached to a specific like, model of how, for example, to communicate or how to listen. And so what I've found over time is that how can we absorb and explore and embody the essence of tools like nonviolent communication, like internal family systems, like restorative justice, but a way that is integrated with other perspectives, that's flexible, that's principle-based rather than holding on to the form. And this is something which, I mean, I think spiritual teachers have talked about for millennia. I mean, it's in the teachings of the Buddha, it's in the teachings of Lao Tzu in, in the Tao Te Ching, and I'm sure it's in the Bible as well, like that, that there's, there are ways in which if we stick only to the letter of the, the law or the, the, the letter of a particular form of personal development or personal behavior, 
we can sometimes lose the most beautiful essence. And so for myself, the exploration has been, how can we bring together different perspectives, stay flexible, stay open, stay and realize that it's not about people speaking a certain way, but helping people learn to connect more deeply to themselves and to, the, uh, and to others and to raise awareness more broadly rather than through a only through a specific lens. Mm, I think that's it's, yeah, an incredibly powerful point. I'm, I'm always brought back to our kind of our shared passion of, of martial arts and, you know, really shows up pertinently there that the difference between sort of a very good martial artist and the, the great martial artist is not kind of sticking to, oh, in this context, you might deliver this move, but kind of, as you say, that ability to flow flexibly and kind of like adapt um, in depending on your context, um, rather than that kind of rigid pattern following. Um, yeah, and it's such a fascinating point because, you know, when you, when you outline it like that, it's, it seems sort of almost obvious that, you know, in the deep complexity of human beings, there's not going to be a, a single modality which is going to hold all the answers to how we engage with ourselves or engage with others. But why, why do you think it is that it's often so hard for, for people to kind of take that perspective or in, to invert it? How e why do you think it is that it's so easy for people to kind of latch on and get that kind of rigidity around a specific, specific modality? What I've seen in myself and in others and what I've also heard others describe in theory is that human development, there's something that really can be served by, okay, I'm excited about this new, new tool and I, that we really find it useful, I think, as human beings to go deep at times like, wow, okay, this, this particular, like, let's say it's meditation, or let's say it's a particular kind of meditation, let's say Vipassana meditation, wow, this led to a certain insight for me, or, or it has a certain attraction to me. And, and when I when it's made a big difference at a, at a certain point, that may inspire me to say, oh, I want to go really deep into that particular practice, or you could say, it could, it could be any, any activity, right? But I think there's something that can be served in deeply immersing ourselves for a period of time in a particular practice or lens. And so I think having that tendency to say, this is it, can serve a purpose for us to, to get focused, to go deep, and to really learn to integrate something fully and not always, but for in many cases, we might then begin to run into the ceiling or the limitation of only sticking to that particular tool or practice. And so at that time, I think there can be a, a natural developmental tendency to realize, okay, I've learned what I need to learn from kind of focusing really narrowly on this particular perspective or, or practice. And now I'm kind of ready to to push off from that and, and maybe just sort of explore again for a while or go deeply into something else. And so I think that there's a, there's a functional adaptive purpose to that kind of focus. And I think it's helpful for us to be aware of when maybe that's run its course or when it actually might not be serving life to be so focused on just one, one approach. Mm. I'm curious how, how that resonates for you. Yeah, it, it resonates really strongly. I think one of the other interesting reflections that I, I have more at the kind of the social level is kind of the role in the, the safety of kind of an ident identity groupings and kind of finding a tribe and how that kind of can play yeah. into to that kind of attachment, you know? Absolutely. And it's, it's so interesting that even in a context like self-development where, you know, we're almost trying to be aware of and break out of those patterns in ourselves, that safety and comfort of having my group who kind of coalesce around this, yeah. you know, be it sort of set of practices or, or beliefs, which then become part of how we, we identify and how we kind of communicate with each other and all the rest of it can lead to, the, to that furthering of that, that attachment, as you say, and maybe not breaking out quite so soon as we would without, without that. Beautifully said. Yeah. I, I, this, the, the tendency toward groupthink or sort of self-reinforcing behavior within subcultures is such a, a crucial thing to be aware of. And what, what you're naming, it reminds me of the value that I found in the work of Arnold Mendel, uh, who wrote um, 
Sitting in the Fire and many, many other books on uh, the work of process work is the work he's developed also with his wife, uh, Amy Mendel. And what I really appreciate in process work is the constant reminder to be aware of what's getting marginalized and what's getting mainstreamed or centralized in any group, in any system, in any culture. And so I really like to bring that awareness into any community or any group that I'm a part of. It's just like, how can we notice on a consistent, ongoing basis, wait, what's getting marginalized? Is it getting marginalized to be silly? Is it getting marginalized to be serious? Is it getting marginalized? marginalized to be passionate? Is it getting marginalized to be, uh, you know, intellectual or to be emotional? And because, of course, you know, there may be times when we want to emphasize certain aspects of our being, but if we consistently as a community or as, as an individual block out certain parts of us as appropriate and other parts as inappropriate, we limit our flexibility and potential to bring to bear the, the amazing complex wealth of the, the human spirit to, to any particular situation. So I, I think, you know, it, it really served us to be aware of exactly what you're, you're talking about, that tendency to marginalize certain perspectives or, or aspects of us. Mm, yeah, absolutely. And again, something that I've been really thankful for in, in my experience of, of your work is kind of having that, that awareness at the center, both in terms of, of ways of being, be it kind of, you know, drifting towards over intellectualism versus kind of speaking from a place of feeling or, you know, or the inverse or, but also of, you know, whose perspectives, who, what, what positions in society are, are not being currently sort of regarded here. Um, and I wonder how, you know, how do you A, navigate that and B, really try to sort of bring it forward in your work in a context where kind of unavoidably in, in a number of cases you are working with kind of the, the more privileged members of society? I know not always, but I guess particularly in the, the residential work and things like that, um, how, ensuring that that doesn't then sort of block out that awareness of, of marginalization um, and, and potentially inviting that in to, to some degree. Mm -hmm. Yeah, thanks. It's interesting how, as you name that, I realized that this particular format where you're interviewing me really emphasizes me as sort of more the expert or the one who knows, which I, I'm open to stepping into sometimes, and yet it, it doesn't feel actually so uh, habitual or mm. natural for me to be so much in the position of the one who's sort of offering the the perspective or the you know the kind of framework and the reason for that is that often in groups I'm more interested in what I would call facilitating I'm more interested in facilitating coming from the Latin of like to make easy you know I'm, I'm more interested in how can I elicit from the group a certain exploration and so when I'm in a group I notice that even if we might say, oh, this is quite a privileged group, which as you said, I do work with all kinds of groups. And, and certainly when I'm working in prison or I'm working with certain activist groups, I'm, I'm working with people from very different socioeconomic backgrounds. But let's say I'm, I'm with a, a group that might be considered uh, on the surface more privileged. I've actually never come across a group where there aren't different layers of stratification within that group. So in other words, there's, there's going to be some voices within the room which are somehow holding the perspective of the more marginalized, um, whether it's clearly visible or not. And so for me, it's also a matter of how can I listen for and help surface and amplify those voices? So for example, I'll give a really concrete example. At a recent, uh, in a re recent gathering that I was a part of, I I noticed, for example, a certain imbalance in terms of which voices were speaking more fully, like in one case, male voices in relation to female voices. And um, I found that I could, without necessarily stepping in as like an authority saying, this shouldn't be happening or look at what's happening, but it's like maybe it's just sometimes asking a question or reflecting when I heard a certain voice, just reflecting 
what I heard was important to that person, just to bring a bit more uh, attention to the dynamic in the space. And so th there's many different ways to do this, but how can we just through our awareness and through subtle, what I think of almost like acupuncture point interventions, just bring a compassionate shine and compassionate light on what's happening in a way that doesn't hopefully evoke shame or shut down in anyone, but just invites us in, oh, I would also love to hear from so-and-so about this perspective. So that's just one, one concrete example, I think, of, of how we can be aware of what's happening in a space and just help invite more wholeness in. And sometimes it might be to ourselves speak to a marginalized perspective, um, but again, I, I try to do that as much as possible in a way that also holds the opposing view with perspective so that I don't just create a, a new opposition in the field. Mm, yeah, I, I love that. And I, I love that really important point of picking up on the kind of subtleties of differential marginalization and privilege internal to, to every group that we're going to encounter. And I think what, what's also really nice about the approach you just surfaced is I think there can be uh, a tendency, and again, I, I don't want to sort of caricature, sort of caricature um, you know, the, the part of me that, you know, or the, the part of others that is kind of more of a, a radical left, left wing perspective or anything, but of kind of going, oh, you know, because X cohort is made up of people that are from a, so, a certain largely socioeconomic band, if not sort of equal position or, you know, largely sort of ethnically um, homogenous or so on and so forth. That therefore there's nothing to be learned there about privilege or that in fact that it's going to become an echo chamber but i think what you're, you're speaking to there is such a beautiful way that we can use any context to cultivate the capacities which will then allow us to go out into the world and engage more powerfully with those differential elements of privilege and of marginalization wherever we might find it um and i think that's that's such a, a wonderful way of approaching that question that i think can quite easily be overlooked by just going on the surface level of like you know this room full of white people has nothing to teach you about privilege to really caricature it quite quite dramatically yeah as you say that I'm, I'm I think immediately of the work of Resma Menachem who wrote my grandmother's hands and is uh in my opinion an, an amazing uh trailblazer in his work looking at how racialized trauma lives in the nervous system of uh people, uh, he, what he calls people of culture or what might be otherwise called people of color. And in, in particularly he's talking about the US context as well as in white people, as well as in uh, police uh, officers, et cetera. And what he says, I think uh, resonates with what you're saying, which is there, there's, he believes that it's actually essential for some of this work of healing racialized trauma to happen in affinity groups, essentially, to happen with white people, with white people doing their inner work to heal their racialized trauma. And similarly, for communities of color to be doing some of their healing work on their own. And that doesn't preclude the possibility of also, of course, multi-ethnic or multi-racial groups doing profound healing work together, but to realize that there's, there are going to be different challenges and different opportunities in each of those contexts. And that I think that actually we can do profound anti-oppression or healing of a, a, a pressure, oppressive patterns in, for example, groups that might on the surface seem very homogenous or privileged. Mm. Yeah, absolutely. That's a, a, a wonderful point. And I think just to, to pick up on there, like the, the power of the group. And I know this is something that, that's really, really core to a lot, of, a lot of your work is this kind of the collective element of transformation, both in terms of, you know, how can we transform as groups, but also the role of the group is kind of like mm -hmm. a, a facilitator of personal and individual transformation. Mm -hmm. Um, and that kind of leads me quite nicely. I think I'd be remiss if I didn't touch on the work that you're kind of collaborating with and, and joining life itself in, in developing, namely these kind of, you know, group-based residential processes for transformation. So firstly, would you just want to outline a little bit like what those look like and, and the idea behind them at kind of the, the high level? 
Yeah, this is work I absolutely love because it's it's the context that I most trust for for deeper transformation. And so basically these residencies, uh, the ones that we're going to be running in Bergerac, France this autumn, uh, so September, October and November of 2022 in Bergerac, France at the Life Itself Hub there, uh, we're calling these residencies embodying collective transformation, community residencies. And so we begin each month with a week-long intensive training. And then for the rest of the month, there's a much more open space kind of residential option as well. So in other words, some people may come for just the week-long training at the beginning of the month, and then a number of us will stay on for the entire month. Many people co-working, having their, for example, maybe remote jobs or otherwise, you know, spending their time how they wish much of the time for those remaining three weeks, but then continuing to engage as a community of practice. Um, and so what I love about this format is that so the week long intensive training allows uh, us to be living together with a group of people doing this inner work, interpersonal work exploring things like how do we develop a deep practice of self-connection? How do we empathically listen? How do we uh, mediate conflict? How do we make decisions effectively, uh, collaboratively? And how do we give and receive? This is to me one of the most essential. Is how do we give and receive conscious feedback that actually is generative and transformational? Because many people, at least many organizations that I work with say, oh, feedback is essential, but they struggle with the actual implementation of making it effective and supportive to people's development rather than shaming or uh, actually limiting some, I think, healthy growth. So we, we do a deep dive into practicing these essential competencies. And then for those who stay on for the rest of the month, we, we get to live together in community and more deeply live that out in a, in a more natural way that you might in your daily life. And so what I find in community is that unlike, let's say, the one-on-one -on -one therapy I do with people, when I work th we're therapeutic with people, I have one hour a week typically with a client. Okay, they may have great insights. That's wonderful. However, what we have when we live together in a transformational community, when you have a group of people who are committed to doing this kind of developmental work, and when we have some shared practices, it turns every waking moment <laughs> into a transformational opportunity. And it turns actually each person into their own therapist and, and into a bit of a therapist for each other. We, we begin to be able to show up with, with awareness, with authenticity, with empathy in ways that actually can elicit healing and awakening moments throughout the day. And so I have found that this actually accelerates, amplifies the, the healing and the growth process immensely. And, and this is no small thing. It's also a lot of fun in my experience. Oh, of course, you know, there, there can be pain, there can be struggle in moments, but overall, when these communities are, I think when the container is clear, when they're well held, and when we have some of these shared skills, it's for me the most enjoyable way I could ever imagine living and spending my time. So that's that's a bit about them. I'm happy to go into them more. And you've had a taste of them yourself, yeah. so I'd be curious to, to hear your own perspective on it. Yeah, absolutely. And I, I was going to say, having, having experienced both Carl's, Carl's programs residentially and kind of living in, in that broader community context, it is really incredible how having kind of, I think one of our residents kind of described it as having, you know, a whole number of mirrors that kind of just show versions of yourself and reflect them back to you and all of your own kind of whatever you're bringing into that space is kind of reflected back and all of a sudden you know you you've got to deal with it because you're there with a group and you know on the one hand that can on occasion be really confronting but also you're held by a bunch of people who are who are there supporting you and that kind of really interesting and amazing combination 
and I think particularly as you touched on when you've you've been given the kind of the tools to to explore and work through that uh, it is a, a deep transformational experience I, I would say from from my own perspective um and you, you've outlined there some of the the core competencies that you think have been really important to build into to the training and kind of you know in, empowerment of people at the start of these programs what's kind of led you to zero in on on particularly those to focus on for that for that initial process and, and why do you think those are the ones that kind of for this end goal of transformation however understood are, are the most vital yeah what i've noticed is it, it, over the years, I've worked as a consultant with organizations. I've worked as a, an educator with young people, with university students. Uh, I've worked as a couples therapist. I've worked with individual people therapeutically. And what I've noticed, I've, I've worked with intentional communities and eco-villages, as I said. And what I've noticed is that as I've done this work in all these different contexts, I began to see the same essential toolkit being the, the one that I brought to each of these different contexts, like that there were certain core skills, whether it's to be a good partner, whether it's to be a good parent, to be a good effective leader, to be an effective team member, to be a community builder, that the same, to be an effective change maker, that certain essential competencies in sort of self-connection or self-awareness, knowing what we're feeling emotionally, we're knowing what our needs are, being able to make effective requests, but in certain competencies in it, how we relate to other people, like how we listen, how we, as I said, navigate conflict, et cetera, that these were universally useful across these mm -hmm. contexts. And I got really interested in distilling these these practices down to their essential elements. And then what was delightful confirmation for me is that as I put together this toolkit, then I encountered things like the <clears throat> inner development goals, which is an initiative uh, coming out of Sweden in particular, although it's also, it's an international effort, but it's basically a consortium of practitioners, educators, thinkers who are, looking at what are the inner competencies that are essential to address the sustainability development goals that the United Nations has articulated. And as I looked through their list of different uh, competencies, I, they, they are entirely a match for the practices that I've been developing in my own curriculum. And so, and I don't think it's only the, these two initiatives that, that bear a resemblance. I think we're, we're beginning to see that there's some core capacities for inner and interpersonal navigation that, that simply are kind of like the building blocks for effective human uh, experience in the 21st century. And, and that's, that's what I see what I'm doing as, as being a, a part of contributing to. Mm. Yeah, um, wonderful. And it's, been, it's so fascinating to see, isn't it, that there is this seeming deep coherence between you know what's coming out of the the more cutting edges of, of psychotherapy and cognitive science and the alignment with kind of you know wisdom, wisdom traditions that have been around for, for thousands of years and you know practitioners like your, yourself and the idgs it does it does speak to this kind of really fundamentally a picture of a, a core human nature in some sense and it, it's such a I, that's been an for me quite an interesting cultural turn from the you know postmodernist rejection of any sort of all intrinsic nature almost in, in many ways that actually we're kind of seemingly being drawn back to, to this idea that there is some degree of essentialism in, in the human experience yeah yeah and interesting <laughs> as you say that is that i immediately can see the counterpoint right that, that, that yeah. there is a both and absolutely that there that admittedly, I'm absolutely coming from a Western educated per perspective. And so like, I, I have my, my lenses through which I look at the world, I try to look at multiple lenses as, as fully as I can. And undoubtedly, you know, it will look different in different places on the planet. But I, I sometimes use the metaphor of, let's say, uh, the permaculture principles, or, you know, something like that, where it's like, if you're creating a permaculture garden or a permaculture farmstead, it's going to look different in 
Tasmania, then in Siberia, then in the jungles of Brazil. And, and yet there are essential principles that are common. And I think that's any anthropologist or, you know, would, would say something similar is that we do see certain universals that, that arise and there's a remarkable diversity of manifestations culturally on the planet as well. And so I think, you know, keeping that dialectic alive of seeing like, okay, is this looking like a relatively universal aspect? And staying humble about like, okay, and how can we continue to keep this flexible and dynamic and sensitive to different, different contexts as well. So mm. I, I, I hope to keep that humility while I do my best to give something that I, that I think is useful and I've, many people have found useful in a wide range of contexts. Absolutely. And it's, it's, you know, it's once again, bringing the, the wholeness to, to that perspective and engagement, right? And as you say, acknowledging the, the deep truth of subjectivity that the kind of postmodern perspective brings, while also saying that actually there are these potentially the, these core either characteristics, competencies, however one wants to couch them, that while culturally mediated might speak sort of a, across us as, as human beings. And that, that both and I think is a, a really great way to, to frame that. Now, I think one of the, so we're, we're just getting started with these residencies. We're kind of having the the first official pilots, as you, as you say, in the autumn, which is going to be like, you know, a really, really exciting experience and experimentation in many ways of, of implementing these practices in, in this way. Um, so I suppose what then would be your hope to, to accomplish through these programs in, in the longer term? How would you, how would you hope these, these might evolve and, and contribute to, to the world in, over time? Yeah, I'm, I'm quite excited about both continuing to offer these kinds of residencies in different locations. So this fall, as we've said, they'll be occurring in Bergerac, France. Next year, we're looking to offer uh, something quite similar at the Berlin Life Itself Hub in Berlin, Germany. Uh, I do also travel around the world to, to offer at this time, usually multi-day, just something, something between three and five day trainings in different contexts. Sometimes I return repeatedly to the same community to offer you know, ongoing stages of this kind of training. And so I imagine that continuing to evolve such that there can be different ways that people can engage through in-person trainings like this. Um, we also are going to be offering online versions of this. We, we have been, I've been doing this kind of work actually quite a bit during the pandemic, the coronavirus pandemic through online programs. And we'll continue to do that. We'll be offering some online versions of this curriculum starting uh, again this fall of 2022. And we're also developing then materials. So a handbook and uh, other books will be produced in the coming year which will give people a, this toolkit in you know, a text form. And we will also be providing some digital uh, resources as well so that people can have a range of different uh, practices and uh, formats to access this kind of material and, and this kind of community of practice. One of the things that I'll just name as well as a core practice that we use both in the residencies and then ongoingly after any of the trainings we run, either online or in person, is, or what we call pods. Um, and my friend and colleague, uh, Rich Bartlett, who wrote a piece on microsolidarity, he talks about crews. But basically, how do we also help people form these small groups of, you know, I typically call a pod something between three to five or six people who are in regular shared practice together of supporting each other on our journeys, doing inner work together, giving each other uh, conscious feedback, um, encouraging each other in our projects in the world. You know, the pod, I'm actually a part of more than one pod. And, you know, these, these groups I meet with uh, typically online once a week, and we are there for each other in a way that I find rare in in the world, like that we share a certain kind of intimacy, a sharing of our inner worlds, of our inner struggles, 
of our deepest longings in life in a way that I find, again, deeply therapeutic and, and also like encourages a more um, sort of dynamic form of personal growth and a more sort of fully faceted form of personal growth that is also supported ongoingly through this format. So those are a number of the different kinds of vehicles for this work that, that, we're, that we're putting out into the world and that I'm excited about. Mm, amazing. And yeah, I mean, I suppose I'd, I'd invite you to imagine kind of yourself in, in 20 years time or even 30 or 40 years time looking back and, you know, the materials have been created, the, the programs have been, been run in the, the locations that you're talking about kind of, what would it what would it mean to you to look back and be like, yeah, you know, this is this has done what I, I've hoped. Kind of, we've, you know, pat, pat on the back, Carl. This is, you know, you, you've done it. <laughs> I think the, truly the the real celebration for me would be for it not to just be what my vision has been, but that like what I've been dreaming into has interwoven with and like evolved along with many other people's dreams and visions and gifts. And so I can speak the best I can about what I imagine that might look like based on what I'm passionate about. And, and ultimately it's a mystery what it's going to look like if it's truly my dream, like my true dream will be the interweaving of, of your dream and many other people's dreams as well. But for me, the thought of and I, I feel fortunate that I'm already living this in many ways, but like to be living in uh, an eco village or an intentional community of practice that is really embodying deep reverence for life in how we grow our food in how we relate to one another and how we um, yeah, care for the ecosystem, how we make decisions together, et cetera. So to be living in a community that's a deep embodiment of that kind of consciousness is something that is a huge dream of mine. And I'm glad to already live that in so many ways, but, and to see such communities that I've may perhaps in little ways or in bigger ways, been able to contribute to a network of such conscious communities and eco villages on the planet. Um, I, and to be contributing to the kind of culture and sort of operating system or practices that those communities are able to evolve in their own unique way, in their own culturally uh, appropriate and you know, unique manifestation of their gifts and longings, um, that would be another facet of it. And, and to, to see in education, ideally at all different levels, because I would love to be, again, just one one of the many people who helps to serve the evolution of education at various levels. I would love to see children from a really young age. And I have many participants in my training say to this to me after their training say, oh, I would, I would love for my kids from a really young age to have this training in self-connection and self-compassion and empathy for others. And, and I believe that, that that's already happening in some ways in education and I would love to see that furthered where so in other words that we could imagine children from birth being profoundly supported in embracing their wholeness in nervous system regulation in uh, realizing what it means to be uh, yeah to be a, a compassionate connected being within a larger web of life. I think that that's, I know that that's utterly possible and it's already happening in some ways. And I'd love to see that amplified in, in a thousand, in a thousand ways. So those are, those are some aspects of what I dream of. And, and I think to go back to your point about looking at the larger systems of inequity or, or oppressive systems, to me, none of what I've just described would be meaningful for me if it doesn't also involve everyone on the planet having much more access to that kind of both education and that kind of community living. So in other words, a world in which we, we actually have matured enough as a species that we want everyone to have a certain baseline of safety, of access to food, shelter, you know, health care, uh, and and really like abundant well-being. 
so that's that those those would be things that would contribute to the dream mm. well, it's a it's a beautiful vision you've painted Carl. it really is and you know looking back on, on my own experience i think if the school system had a little bit more car state in it we'd all be living a far far happier life um well i mean thank you so so much for for outlining i think so beautifully so eloquently and so so humbly kind of your visions and kind of you know the the deep care and you know consideration that goes into to what is truly amazing work that you do um if anybody's interested in finding out more you can go to www.lifeitself.us um and take a look at our residencies page for more information around those programs and even book yourself on should you so wish but until then thanks so much for listening and thanks once again carl and look forward to speaking soon thanks so much theo thanks everybody